Okay, hi everybody. Time for us to start a new unit. We're just going to touch on it now and uh, we'll get into it more in the coming weeks, but it's on dynamic programming. Um, and there's a related technique that we'll also talk about, and actually this is mostly what we'll talk about today, called memoization, which is a fun word, memoization. Um, so these are two related techniques, and so we can think of these as new, like, programming uh, algorithm paradigms. So we've looked at like divide and conquer and some related kind of approaches like that. So this is another big um, technique or paradigm for how we can approach problem solving. And the key here, as we'll see, is these techniques are useful when we have a lot of repeated recursive calls. So we'll see exactly what that means, how these techniques help. Um, memoization ends up being easy to implement, but a little bit hard to analyze. Dynamic programming is hard to come up with, but then once we come up with it, it's pretty easy to implement and analyze. Um, so we'll start with memoization, which is kind of like easy to throw it, but it's a little bit harder to understand. And then we'll move into dynamic programming and we'll look at a number of examples. So the first example we're gonna look at, this is kind of the classic example that everybody starts with, with when you're talking about memoization. So why, why, why fight uh, history? Um, and it's the Fibonacci numbers, computing the Fibonacci numbers. So I just want to emphasize that the point isn't to say, like, I want to make you the best computers of Fibonacci numbers. It's just a really good example for thinking about when memoization and dynamic programming are going to be useful. So don't try to think too hard about, like, wait, but what about specifically computing Fibonacci numbers? Maybe I could do it differently. Just think about um, the techniques that we're applying and, and we're gonna see other circumstances besides just like computing the series of numbers where these same techniques are gonna be super useful. So here's a version of the Fibonacci number computation. And you should, um, you should probably have seen this before. So like Fib of zero is zero, and Fib of one is one. Fib of two is zero plus one, which is one. Fib of three is one plus one, which is two. Fib of 4 is 1 plus 2, which is 3. Fib of 5 is 2 plus 3, which is 5. So it grows really slowly at the beginning, but each time it's the um, sum of the previous two values. So Fib of 6 is 3 plus 5, which is 8. Fib of 7 is 5 plus 8, which is 13. Fib of 8 is 21. Fib of 9 is 35. Fib of 10 is 55. And that's usually as far as uh, I need to remember. Um, so it grows really slowly at the beginning, but then the sequence grows faster and faster. Um, and let's see what this looks like when we actually compute it. Um, so I have this coded up here. Uh, here's my function. Here I wrote it as an if else if statement with zero and one, but you could write this more succinctly with like if n less than or equal to one return n. Either way, it's doing the same thing. And of course the the big deal is this recursive case here that's calling fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. So let's check a few values like fib of 5, I think, uh, oh, <laughs> to say fib dot fib of 5. My module is called fib. So that, that fits. And let's try fib dot fib of 9. Should be 34. And yes, that's because... I can't add 13 plus 21 is indeed equal to 34. <laughs> so the computer is better at me, better than me. Um, but I'm quite confident that fib of 10 should be 55. And there it is. Okay, good. Um, and now we want to think about, okay, how fast is this? One way to start to get an idea is to see what kind of numbers we can type in and how long it takes. So like fib of 20, that comes back right away. 67, 65, I'll just Assume that that's right. Okay, how about fib of 30? Hmm, already when I type fib of 30, it, it the computer hesitates a little bit before returning the answer. Hmm, what about fib of 40? Uh-oh. So already with fib of 40, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a minute or something to come up with this value. So this is an indication that, like, this should be a big red flashing, like, oh, crap, our function is really slow. Because for for a size of 40, it really should not take a minute to compute anything unless we have an exponential time function. 
So right away we can see, we'll analyze this in a second, but we have an exponential time algorithm here. Now, why is it exponential time? Well, let's take a look. Um, let me add a new page. Okay, so you know this is a recurrence function, and we can write this recurrence like this. It's 1 when n is less than or equal to 1. We just return 0 or 1. And otherwise, it's um, a single addition plus two recursive calls on n minus 1 and n minus 2. This looks almost exactly the same as the definition of the Fibonacci numbers itself, which is right away like that's an indication that there's a problem. If the running time is equal to the value of the output, um, that's usually not a good sign. And here, to analyze this, it's not going to be, we can't just directly plug this into one of our master methods. Why not? Is because um, these are not the same. Right, so these are different. The recursive call sizes are different, so we can't use the master method uh, directly. But what we can do is approximate it in either direction. So we can say that t of n, what's an upper bound? Well, of these two recursive calls, t of n minus 1 is the bigger one. So this is definitely less than or equal to 1 plus 2 times t of n minus 1. And if you plug that into master method b, you'll see that this is really the same as like the bad version of computing the max that we saw. Um, it's going to be exponential time because this is a 2. And the base of the exponent is going to be, um, is going to be 2. So... Uh, it's going to be 2 to the 1 power. Um, so this is going to be big O of 2 to the n in total. Now, why did I say big O here? It's because I took an upper bound approximation. This is a less than or equal to, right? This isn't exactly what t of n is. We're just saying, OK, this is an upper bound approximation. So OK, it's less than 2 to the n time. But is that a way overestimate? Is it really exponential time? Well, to answer that, we can think of a lower bound. Um, Remember, when we can't exactly analyze a function, we can approximate it with an upper bound and a lower bound. So what's a lower bound here? Well, out of these two recursive calls, t of n minus 2 is the smaller. So this is definitely going to be bigger than 1 plus 2 times t of n minus 2. And if we use the second master method that we saw, OK, this is going to be now a little bit trickier, but it's still going to be exponential time because of this 2. And the base of the exponent is going to be 2 to the power 1 half. So it's going to be um, the square root of 2. So it's going to be, we can say this is big omega of square root of 2 to the n, which is about uh, 1.41 to the power n. So what we know is, and again, that's a big omega because we did an approximation. This is, an, uh, this is a lower bound. We know this isn't exactly what the recurrence t of n is. It's just t of n is greater than or equal to that. So what we have is we have an upper bound of 2 to the n and a lower bound of 1.41 to the n. So what we really know is that it's something to the n. It's definitely exponential time. And at this point, that's probably all we really care about. If you really want to calculate exactly what this is, I'll tell you that, um, well, I explained it a little bit more in the written notes if you want to look that up. But it's, it's some number between 1.41 and 2. And um, it's a number that's very important for everything related to Fibonacci numbers. Um, but yeah, it's definitely going to be exponential time. And so let's see if it ever finished. Yes, so Fib of 40 finally finished, but it took a while. I think if we typed Fib of 50, it would never finish within any of our lifetimes. Um, so this is bad. How can we do better? Well, we can take a look at what's bad about it by thinking about the recursion tree. So think about just fib of 6. What are all the recursive calls that happen? It's this picture right here. So fib of 6 calls fib of 4 and fib of 5. Fib of 4 calls fib of 2 and fib of 3. Fib of 2 calls fib of 0 and fib of 1. Fib of 3 calls fib of 1 and fib of 2. Fib of 0 and fib of 1. And, and OK, so this is the full tree of all the recursive calls that happen for fib of 6. What you should notice is that the leaves are all fib of 0 and fib of 1, because that's the base case. And now, um, 
let's think for a second. So then the values are going to come out of this, right? So this returns zero, this returns one, this adds zero plus one to get one. Then this returns zero, this returns one, this adds um, zero plus one, this returns one, this adds one plus one, which is two. And this one is going to add um, one plus two. And then up here, this returns zero, this returns one, this is one is zero plus one, this returns one, this is, and what you should notice is that we're just doing the same work over and over and over again. This is going to be adding up the same values many, many times, repeating the same exact computation over and over and over again. Um, so if we keep doing this, if we were doing this as humans, we would at some point say like, wait a second, I'm wasting all my time here. Why do I keep adding up zero plus one again and again when I could just remember that fib of two equals one, right? Why am I adding up? So now for like the fourth time, I'd, I'm adding up for fib of three is two equals one plus one. But I could have just remembered from one of the previous times when I figured out fib of three that fib of three is two. And now I'm computing fib of four for the second time and so on like that. So what we see is that for each value, they get increasingly called many more times. So like fib of six, that's only done once right here. Fib of five, well, how many times does that happen? Um, again, just once. All right, sounds good. But then as we start to go down, they happen more and more times. So fib of four happens twice, right here and right here. What about fib of three? Well, I see one, two, three. So it looks like that one runs three times. Fib of two, is it gonna be four times? Let's take a look. Fib of two is once, twice, thrice, I don't know how to say anymore, so four times and five times. You should notice something about this pattern that will reveal what fib of one, how many times have we call that? It's These are exactly equal to these Fibonacci numbers. So fib of one, I think, gets called eight times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And fib of zero will get called 13 times. So what's happening is that we actually have an exponential number of calls to all these. And so what the idea of memoization is we want to save the previously computed values in a table. So that these two times that we call fib before, what we're gonna do is actually cut out. So once we compute fib before once, when we go to compute it again, we wanna cut this whole part of the tree off, cut this off and just return three from remembering. If we were doing this as humans, we would probably just do that automatically. But in order to do that by computer, we have to explicitly tell the computer how to do it. And of course, we're not just going to remember fib of four, but we're going to remember fib of three, fib of two, fib everything. And so what you end up doing is you have, uh, this is a technique called memoization. And what you do is you just save a table. A table which is going to be, uh, for us, a hash table. Um, this is the syntax for creating a Python dictionary, but you could use um, a map if you were in C++ or in Java. And what you're going to do is whenever you um, have a new computation, you first check if it's not in the fib table, that's where you do your actual work. Um, so you either return it directly uh, if it's in the base case, or you add it up and store that in the table, and then you, um, then you return from the table lookup. If it's in the table, you just return it from the lookup. So what happens is the first time we call like fib of six or fib of five or fib of four, the first time we have to do this work in the middle. We have to do these steps. But then after that, once we've done this once for that value, then we're gonna be able to skip all this and just skip to um, doing the table look up here. So after the first time, all we're gonna do is just this. 
And so what's going to happen is that all this work that we had to do before, um, we kind of only have to do this the first time, and later times we just get to do a table lookup. And so this is a this is a fib memo that we have written here using explicitly um, fib memoization. Let's just check how it seems to work in practice before we start to think about the analysis. Um, so we saw that fib of 40 took like minutes and minutes. If I do not div, but fib memo of 40, it happens right away. Even fib memo of like 10,000. Oh, okay, we have a we have a recursion depth error. But um, what I was going to say is that if we if we really cranked this up, then it might take a few seconds to compute it the first time, but Later times, uh, let's see how high we can do. I know there's a way to increase the recursion depth. I just don't remember off the top of my head. The first time we compute something, it might take a little bit of time. But later times, we would just be looking it up. But even computing it the first time. So remember, fib, mem fib of 50 was like out of the question. We would, we would never have any hope of computing this number using the normal recursive version. Now with fib memo, we can easily compute fib of 500. And it takes you know a split second. Um, and so it seems like that when you do memoization, it's only going to like save you the second time. But because it's a recursive function, because there's so many repeated recursive calls, what we end up doing is we cut off the entire computation. right? So what we're going to do is in this original tree where we had so many recursive calls, it actually becomes just this one. So for fib memo of 6, we do fib memo of 5 plus fib memo of 4. That one does fib memo of four plus fib memo of three. So the first time we have to go all the way down. But then what happens is that when we start to come back up, this is now the second time. And this is now the second time. And this is now the second time. So all three of these are just table lookups. And that cuts out massive parts of this whole tree. Because not only do we get to do this fib memo of four faster, but we also don't have to do any of the other recursive calls that are underneath that. And for fib memo of three, that's faster, but it's also all of the things that were underneath that, including more calls of fib memo of two and stuff, those are all gone because we just kind of cut off this recursion the second time we come back to it. Okay, so what memoization does, it works in general, and it's just a way of saying that I'm gonna remember all the previous times when this function was called. And when you call it again, I'm gonna first check if I've seen that number before, then I'm gonna look it up in the table instead of doing the recomputation. Um, and just one small comment about, uh, this is kind of a Python thing, but it can be used in some other languages as well. So we saw uh, in the slides there, an explicit version of writing the memoized version. In some languages, you can do what's called automatic memoization. So if you check this out, this is how I wrote it in Python. Um, this is what's called a function decorator. This takes in a function. So this is a little bit of like programming stuff. It's a little bit outside the scope of the course, but I just think it's fun to think about. Um, this takes in a function, any function, and returns a memoized version of that function. So it makes a class that saves the memo, saves the table, and saves the original function itself. And then whenever you call this function, it's going to try to look it up in the table. If it's there, if it's not there, then it calls the function and puts it in the table. And then it just returns whatever was in the table. Um, so now in Python, you can do this special syntax. You might have seen this if you've done Python programs with the at sign. So what this says is call my decorator. So call my memoize, my memoizer function on this function. And so this, like, notice I, I wrote this exactly the same way that I wrote the fib function. Um, but now it's going to be memoized because it's actually going to call this thing with this function inside of it. Um, so Python is a language where you can do automatic memoization. You can see my automatic memoizer right here. Um, there's other languages where this happens automatically. Some programming languages like Haskell um, have special rules that actually you don't even have to tell it to do memoization. It just does it for you on every function. And one of the questions um, we'll think about in the coming days is, is memoization always a good idea? Is it always better? Um, certainly it's a good idea for the Fibonacci function, but does it always work better? Okay, so now let's think about um, the 
cost of memoization, there's really three things that we have to figure out. So the first question we have to ask, which is similar to the question we would ask for any kind of analysis, is how much extra work? So what this says is for every recursive call, what's the amount of extra work besides the recursions? In the case of Fibonacci, it's really just doing an addition. Okay, so it's just doing one addition, so that's like big O of one extra work. The second qu question we want to ask is how many recursive calls? Number of recursive... This is what we would always worry about, and for Fibonacci there's exactly two recursive calls. But then, instead of saying what's the size of each recursive call, that actually doesn't matter so much with memoization because most of those are going to be table lookups. And so what really matters is the total number of inputs to the recursive calls. Total number of distinct, so distinct meaning different, inputs. This is a hard question to answer. Um, we have to think about how this problem really works. For Fibonacci, we can say that well, we're only ever going to call fib of k. If we call fib of k as a recursive call, then k is going to be an integer between, it'll never be smaller than 0, and it'll never be larger than our original input size n. So that means the total number of distinct inputs for Fibonacci is at most n plus 1. And then the total cost is going to be, uh, can be computed as the, cost, assuming everything is a table lookup, cost of one time, assuming all the recursive functions are table lookups, times the number of distinct inputs. Because basically what, what we're saying is that um, all of the recursive calls I make, most of them are going to be just table lookups, except for this many times, except for n, n plus 1 times when we see a new input. Then we actually have to do this work again. Um, and so for us, if we, use a, if we were to use a, like a balanced tree or something, then we would get log n times n. So we basically get n log n time because each table lookup would be log n and the number of distinct calls is n plus 1. Um, but uh, we can use in general, we'll probably want to use a hash table instead. So then we can't say that it's the worst case cost, but we can say that the expected um, total runtime is big O of just one. So this is extra work is one plus the table lookups is two times one times uh, n plus one for the number of distinct calls. So that's just going to be big O of n. Um, this is using a hash table. And I want to emphasize that it's a little bit tricky to get it, especially this value. So I've already highlighted that, but I'll highlight it again. This is the tricky part of doing a memoized analysis. In general, we're going to get like an upper estimate on this, right? Like we didn't technically prove that every value between 0 and n gets computed by Fibonacci. We just tried to make an argument that, OK, every input that comes in is going to be some integer between 0 and n. So it's going to be at most n plus 1 distinct inputs. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we get a big O bound. And the other reason is that we usually just assume that the extra work is for like the biggest size. Here it's constant anyway, so it, it wouldn't matter what n is for the extra work. But that's another place um, where we usually get an overestimate here. So we usually get a, just a big O bound. We don't actually get a big theta bound because you should think of memoization as something that's easy, simple to apply, right? I can write this. You can copy my memoized decorator right now and apply this to any function you like, and it'll work. It'll memoize it. But the tricky part is thinking how much help is that going to give us? What's the analysis going to be? So here we just get a big O upper bound. And what we'll see... Um, next class and in the future is how we can use dynamic programming once we really understand what the memoization is doing. Dynamic programming is like, okay, now I actually understand the memoization and I'm going to customize it to this one problem. So memoization is like this general thing that you can just throw onto any recursive, um, any recursive function and maybe it'll make it faster, but you know, maybe not. And we have to work hard to figure out how much. 
Um, dynamic programming is the way to kind of customize this for your particular problem and really make it work um, at the best efficiency. Okay, thanks. See you later.